Hey, this is Leo for Actualized.org, and in this video, I'm going to talk about id, ego, and the superego. All right, welcome back. So let's talk about the id, the ego, and the superego. In this video, I want to cover what these concepts are and how they play into practical personal development. How do we actually apply these old school concepts from really Sigmund Freud back in the early 1900s? How do we take them and how do we make sense of them and actually use them to help us today in our own lives to improve our self-control and our ability to be happy and successful? So let's talk about that. Let's really define what the id the ego and the superego are. Like I said, these are some old school concepts coming from Sigmund Freud way back in the day. And in a lot of ways, they're somewhat obsolete today. They're somewhat archaic. And the whole Sigmund Freud school of thought, the whole analytical, psychoanalytical school of thought is in many ways not what you want to be using in order to move forward in your own personal growth. What I'm delivering to you guys through Actualize.org is more practical, more modern ideas, things that you can go out there and apply. But we can still take some lessons from this old model that Freud developed, and we can see how we can use it to help us today. So a really good analogy that I loved, and I got from Jonathan Haidt, who wrote The Happiness Hypothesis. There he gives us this amazing analogy for what the id the ego and the superego are. He says it's like this. Imagine in the old times, there's an old buggy, a horse carriage drawn buggy. And here you've got the horses, which are pulling this buggy forward at breakneck speed. Then what do you got? You've got the rider on top of the buggy who is holding the reins and trying to control the horses, trying to steer the horses He's also got a whip, so he's whipping the horses to make them run. And that is like the relationship between the id and the ego. The id are the horses. The ego is the rider. He's trying to control the horses. But then, inside the carriage, behind the rider, is his old father. And his father is yelling at the rider, telling him, where to steer the carriage. And that is like the super ego. So I love this image because it's so easy to remember and it just clearly illustrates what each one of these functions of the psyche are. And that's exactly what Freud was talking about here. These are functions of the psyche. The id, the ego, and the super ego. So what is the id? The id is the horse or the multiple horses that you've got pulling your carriage forward. So what is that literally? Well, that can be described as your more base instinctual desires. This is that force within you, that force within your psyche that is looking for instant gratification, that is looking for pleasure. It's more or less unconscious, right? The way that you would imagine a horse. A horse is just kind of doing its own thing. It's not too worried about where we're going. It's just hungry or it's thirsty or it wants to run or it doesn't want to move. And that's just the horse. Then you've got the ego. The ego is the rider. He's the rational one. He is the more conscious one, and he's the one who's in control. He's thinking long term. He's planning. He's the realistic person. He's the, the strategic element of the psyche. He's that part of you that's being rational and that's planning your life. That's the ego. And it's trying to rein in the id is trying to rein in the horses because sometimes the horses want to do crazy things that are not healthy for the overall, the overall carriage and rider situation. It might even be something that's not healthy for the horses themselves. Maybe the horses decide that they will go want to lead the carriage and themselves off a cliff. And they'll do that unless the rider holds them back and steers them in the right direction. And then, of course, we can't forget the lovable old cranky man, the father, sitting in the carriage behind the rider, and he's the wise one. 
He's the one who knows best. He's got experience. He's got morals. He's got ideals. He's got high standards. He is the societal influence, you might say. And he's the one who's lecturing, who's moralizing the rider on how to best steer the horses. So he might criticize the rider in one aspect of how he manages the horses, or he might, he might offer some suggestion or some advice about how it should be done better. And that is the superego. And what is that? Well, that's the part of our psyche that is the moralizing part. It's our conscience, you might say. It's that part that is the ideal self, but also the critical self. It's that inner critic that we all have that tells us that we know we could be doing better and that we should be living up to something more than we currently are. So this is the dynamic. The id, the ego, the superego. And this is how Freud thought of it. This is how Freud characterized the human psyche, is that he thought that we had this very low base part, which is virtually unconscious. The horses, the id. All it wants are instant gratification and desires, right? Quick hits of pleasure, without thinking about long-term repercussions. Then he imagined we've got the flip side of that, the complete opposite, which is like the, the moralizing side, the ideal side of us, which knows what should be done, which is the conscious part. But it's also the part that can be sometimes too idealistic, too moralizing, too sermonizing. And so then you have this, this function in between, which is the ego, and it's the ego's job to kind of guide between the two extremes. The ego is trying to really live up to the conscience, but on the other hand, it's also trying to appease the horses, and it's trying to appease the, the id. So, yes, the ego wants to, to indulge in pleasures, but it doesn't want to indulge in pleasures in such a way that it's self-destructive and it's going to lead you off a cliff. So, he listens to the superego. And then, sometimes the superego is a little bit too stern and a little bit too... Uh, self-criticizing, too judgmental, and so the, the ego wants to bring it back towards the id. And this is the job of the ego. It's to mediate between these two extremes, like the best in us and the worst in us, to kind of mediate between the two and to keep us on the road, on the road, going forward in life, doing whatever it is that we have to do. Now, there are a few problems here with this model. I mean, first of all, it's not literally how the mind works. This is just more of a kind of a figurative or you know, just a, 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 a di diagram, diagrammatic way of looking at what is going on here. So this is not literally what's happening. You don't actually have an id in your brain. You don't actually have an ego in your brain and a superego. It's all kind of meshed together. And so some of these roles are hard to really de delineate. I think there's something powerful here, though, to the idea that we do have a lower self or something that seems like that in our brain. You know, it's that lower self that tells us that we shouldn't go to the gym today, that we should just take it easy. It's that lower self that says we shouldn't push it at work today. We should just take it easy. Maybe we should just take a vacation. Maybe we should drop off that diet. Maybe we've been good enough, so we should indulge in some TV or some internet or some sort of easy stimulation. Maybe go get that third martini. Maybe go drinking with the friends, go have a party, do something fun, do some recreational drugs, right? That's the id. And we all, we've all been there. We've all given into that. And we also know the dangers of that. The dangers of that are forming bad negative habits that can really destroy your life. I mean, in the, in the worst of situations like drugs, like literally those habits can wreck your entire life. But even in more subtle ways, even in more socially acceptable ways, just simple things like watching television or being addicted to partying and drinking, even though that's so more socially acceptable than hardcore drugs, it's still probably destroying your life and robbing you of all the potential that you've got. So you got to watch out for that. you got to watch out for, the, for that id. Then, of course, we also know the conscience part. And the conscience part, I think, is really where Freud's model here kind of starts to break down is I think the ego is more accurate and the, 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 the superego is the problematic thing. Because really, you don't, have, you don't have this. I mean, you do have some sort of societal conditioning. 
And you probably have morals that you picked up from your parents and from society and from the media and just things from culture that you're told are taboo that are wrong. And so you've got those in the back of your mind. But that is really not your highest self. Your highest self is something different than the superego. Really, if we take this whole model and we, we cut it up in a different way, I think a more accurate way to cut it up would be to simply say you, that you've got your lower unconscious self and then you've got your higher conscious self. Because your conscious self naturally tries to live up to ideals. And it naturally tries to do good. And your higher self, this is where you ultimately want to be. It's not that you should be mediating between your, your lower self and your higher self. No, you should be going totally for your higher self. But this higher self is not the moralistic higher self that your parents taught you about. It's not that, that sermon that you got at church that tells you that if you don't do good and you don't do right, and that if you lie and you cheat and you steal and you have sex, then you're going to go to hell with brimstone and, and pain and torture. It's not, it's not about that. That's not how it works. And I think that this is where Freud's model really starts to break down, is that he was probably coming at it more from this religious context and the societal conditioning context that was telling you what to do. No. In reality, the way it works is that when you're doing things for the lower values, you're doing things just to get pleasure or stimulation or doing things that are easy and comfortable, really what you're doing is you're behaving in an unconscious way. And when you're doing that, that is the evil of the world. That is what's destroying your life. That's also what's causing evil in the world is when people live like that. They live unconsciously. They get angry. They have negative thoughts. They're always judgmental. They're criticizing. They're engaging in activities that are not good for them in the long run. They're they're hurting their health, they're hurting their relationships, they're hurting their businesses, their work, their careers. That is all unconscious. When you start to move towards consciousness, you start to develop more knowledge, more self-awareness, then what happens is that really you move towards your higher self. And your higher self is not a mixture of both good and bad elements, like the superego is. Because the superego, on the one hand, it has ideals, but it also is negative in the sense that it's critical. Right? It's like that critical parent. Well, that parent might have good intentions, but in the end, that criticism that the parent is throwing out, the judgments, the constant nagging, that's not healthy. And that's actually an unconscious behavior. So what we want to do is, in Freud's model, what we would do is we would take the superego, we would carve out that critical part, and we would now move it over into the id. That's where it properly belongs. And so if we reformulate that whole model, then what you've got is you've got the id, which is the negative stuff, and then you've got the higher self. You've got now the new superego, which is what I call the higher self, and that's you being fully conscious. And when you're fully conscious, that's ultimately where you want to be. That's when you're making the best decisions. That's when you're thinking long term. That's when you're able to delay gratification. That's when you're able to be wise. That's when you're able to control your impulses. You're able to control your thought patterns. You're able to do things with complete awareness. You're also very happy with life as it is. You don't always need to be judging and criticizing. Browbeating yourself up all the time. Browbeating yourself and beating yourself up over the fact that you're not able to do as much as you wanted to do. That's not a healthy impulse. Sometimes people get that wrong, and I think that's where Freud got it wrong, is that that's not a healthy impulse. A healthy impulse is being completely conscious, and it's also accepting the fact that you're not perfect, and that you're gonna slip up sometimes, and that that's okay. What you're trying to do is you're trying to be conscious of all your imperfections, as well as the things that are good about you. And really, when you get to a very high level of consciousness in your life, then what happens is that you just become at peace with what is. You're not so worried about striving for something. You're not so worried about judging yourself for doing something wrong or not living up to some sort of goal. You're just more comfortable. You're more at peace. Now, you might say, well, if that's the case, don't you become listless? Don't you become unmotivated? Don't you become lazy? Actually, no. What happens is that when you stop criticizing yourself, you become more motivated. When you're at peace, it's not like you have no motivation now. It's not like you just sit on the couch. In fact, quite the opposite. When you're at peace, everything's okay, and now you have a very healthy emotional foundation from which to act upon. You're not attached to things. 
and that's healthy. To be attached to results and to outcomes is neurotic. So that parent that's sitting in the back of the buggy yelling at his son to steer the cart to the left or to the right, that's really not a healthy relationship. That's not a healthy attitude. That's a neurotic situation. Kind of interesting to think about, huh? How does that apply to your relationship with your parents? Yeah, that's what I thought, right? Probably a little bit of that going on there too. So basically that is what the id, the ego, and the superego is. Now, how does this actually apply to your life and what can you do with this? Well, I think what you do with it is that you, you start to recognize that there are these forces within your mind and there's this tug of war going on. That part of it is pretty accurate. There is a tug of war going on between your lower self and your higher self. And sometimes the lower self wins out, sometimes the higher self wins out, and sometimes we do get confused about really what is the lower self, what is the higher self. Sometimes those elements kind of intermix and it's hard to even distinguish. Is our higher self really doing the best for us? Or does it have elements within it that are actually part of the lower self, that are critical, that are judgmental, that are trying to get us to achieve things that are not really in line with what we want authentically. And I think this is the, the real, uh, the journey of personal development is that you go through this and you start to weed and sort out. Because it's not quite so simple to say what is the lower self and what is the higher self within you. You have to actually do some work. You have to do some introspection, do some personal development. And slowly as you get more experience, you start to see which elements are really part of your higher self and which elements are not. And as you do that, as you make, as you make this, this distinction more and more clear in your mind, it becomes easier for you to become disciplined. It becomes easier for you to go towards the route of consciousness and to do the things that are high conscious and that are good for you. And you don't have to browbeat yourself to get them to happen. It's an easy flowing kind of discipline. And that's really what self-actualization is, is a self-actualized person has made this distinction very clear for himself. And he is naturally, effortlessly guiding himself towards what's good. It's not just doing the bad stuff and knowing that there's good stuff you should be doing. It's knowing the good and the fact that you know what's good makes you want to do it. That's ultimately the level that you want to get to. So I think that's really the power of this idea is that this is something that's real and this is something that you can have in your life is that you can carve out this distinction very clearly for yourself by doing conscious personal development work to the point where the things that are healthy for you are the things that you're doing naturally. I've personally experienced this a lot in the last year in my own life where a lot of the things that I've been struggling with, a lot of the bad stuff that I knew I shouldn't be doing, now I don't do them effortlessly. And that's because of a lot of the work that I've done and a lot of that stuff I try to share with you guys through the other videos that I've got. So that is ego, id, and superego. I hope that got you a little bit more clarity around those classic psychology concepts. All right, so this is it. I'm gonna be signing off. Go ahead, post me your comments down below. I'd love to hear what you guys think. Please like this and share this and spread this around. Share this with a friend on Facebook so that we can get other people conscious about what's going on with their own psychologies. And then of course, if you like this material, go and check out actualized.org because there I've got an amazing free newsletter for you guys. I'm releasing content every week where I'm helping you understand how to self-actualize, how to develop yourself, how to carve out this distinction within yourself, how to find out what are the healthy things in your life and how do you become more conscious and how do you do that more effortlessly so that you're motivated, you're supercharged, you're healthy, you're living the kind of life that you wanna live, you're not bogged down by negative emotions. There's a really a lot of information that I need to get across to you guys to really get that functioning in your life, but I'm trying to do that and when you sign up here, then you're on board, you're taking a commitment, you're committing yourself to living this kind of life, to getting your life taken care of. All right, so that's why I wanna go and sign up. And also there's some free bonuses for signing up. You get an exclusive 19 part video series and you get a chance to win two hours of free coaching, which me, which I give away every month to one of my subscribers.